What happens when you've conquered everything? You've shown your dominance and there aren't many people left unaware or able to defy your greatness. In some cases, this would be the point where the subject in question might decide to rest on their laurels, quit, or recluse until needed again. But this is what separates the good from the great. You see, Sony wasn't content with creating one of the best-selling consoles of all time. They had to push for more. They had to follow up with a system so feature-rich that it would become the very model of consumer-friendly consoles. They had to create one of the most intricate internal systems that, while difficult to develop for, would ultimately be so ahead of its time that the United States Air Force would use it as a base to create a supercomputer. The PlayStation 3 may have been beaten to market by the Xbox 360, but just because you sprint off the starting line doesn't mean that you'll be able to keep that pace for the rest of the race. And Sony proved that they had the stamina to endure and win, setting themselves up to continue their authoritative market control not only on the next generation, but even beyond. Now, counter arguments for the PS3 launch might cite the high price point and low return on investment per console as a key factor for the rough start. Even more people would be likely to tell you that the lowest point for the PS3 launch were the games. The first point I can somewhat agree with. $600 was a lot, even factoring in all the features. But to say that the games weren't good, well that's just a lie. From November 13, 2006 to November 13, 2007, the PlayStation 3 would produce the most unique lineup of first year games, beating out any other console to launch before or after it. So let's look at all the games released from launch through all four quarters of the fiscal year year, finishing with its first anniversary. Here is the PS3's launch year in games. Make no mistake, PlayStation 3 is the most ambitious project we at Sony Computer Entertainment have ever undertaken in our very short history. Sony's PlayStation 3 uses new cutting-edge high-definition technology, which may explain the high price tag. And they still have to pay for the payoff, up to $700 a piece. After a less than stellar E3, Sony finally had the chance to blow everyone away at TGS with more polished titles. And sure enough, they have delivered with more games, more details, and yes, more problems. Does it live up to your expectations? You know what? Like, I played this car game. I forget what it was called, but I mean, I, I, I hate car games, and I played it, and it was, it was awesome. There's no more fitting way to discuss the PS3 launch than to run down the games chronologically. Following the typical business sensibilities, I'll structure this video by looking at what games came out in what quarter. What's important here isn't overly in-depth analysis of these games, though there will be a little bit of that. Instead, we're looking at the trends that they put forth and how some of the exclusives were able to move PS3s. Sony's PlayStation 3 was released to the world on November 11th, 2006 in Japan. North America would get it a little under a week later on the 17th, and Europe and Australia wouldn't get it until March of 2007. Because, you know, Aussies and gaming go together like Marmite and something that doesn't go well with Marmite. I don't know, I've never tried this stuff. Accompanying the large lad was 18 games in total. Mainichi Iso, NBA 2K7, NHL 2K7, Ridge Racer 7, Untold Legends Dark Kingdom, Mobile Suit Gundam Crossfire, NBA 07, Tiger Woods PGA Tour 07, Call of Duty 7, sorry, 3, Genji Days of Blade, Resistance Fall of Man, Madden 07, Need for Speed Carbon, Mahjong Kakuto Club, Zenku Taisiben, Cash Guns Chaos, Blast Factor, Tony Hawk's Project 8, and Marvel Ultimate Alliance. The cross-platform games aren't all that exciting. Most of these titles are obligatory yearly releases with the exception of Tony Hawk's Project 8. This is one of those multi-skew games that got released on the Xbox, PS2, 360, and PS3. Oddly enough, both generations got unique versions. The PS2 is a more traditional Tony Hawk game, while the PS3 saw the Birdman pursue a direction that most fans don't remember fondly. Sports games are more or less a hardware showcase, as yearly releases push developers to find any new element to add to each iteration. It's also an easy bar to measure up game tech against. Better hardware means a closer approximation to reality, which is most of what sim sports are trying to go for. But how did the seventh generation of sports games stack up? 
Graphically, the player models move from standard definition Uncanny Valley to high definition, slightly less unnerving, but more sweaty. The announcer's lines became far more smooth and the physics became more rigid in a good way. And with the added push of this era to be online, rosters could be easily updated and large scale game modes like tournament play or league play became more accessible to a general audience. This generation saw the biggest upgrade in the sports genre as a whole, but it's also the generation that saw the infestation of microtransactions. But at this point, that was an issue yet to take hold, leaving us with a wide variety of decent sports games. The digital download scene was one of the bigger introductions into the gaming sphere in this era. Smaller, cheaper titles that are mostly played like arcade games, typically being infinitely replayable and easy to boot up from the home screen. The three on offer at launch were Cash Guns Chaos, Blast Factor, and Maniichi Iso. Cash Guns Chaos is a twin-stick shooter often compared to Smash TV in a negative way. It's functional, but lacks any real staying power. But fret not ye fans who double fist their sticks. Who wrote that? Blast Factor saw a significantly more favorable reaction, which makes sense. Tight controls, fast-paced gameplay, and quick restarts are all hallmarks of the genre that Blast Factor achieves. The final digital exclusive was only released in Japan. Maniichi Iso is a title in the Doko Demo Isio franchise. Now, despite being a Japan exclusive, this was the kind of title that upon its release was an instant success the world over, selling more copies than The Secret, The Bible, and Kevin Costner's 1992 smash hit The Bodyguard combined. In fact, it's so popular that there's even a statue near Lady Bird Lake here in Austin, Texas commemorating America's favorite cat, Toto. And for more examples, Philadelphia hosts an annual Doko Demo Iso parade every May- Hey, hey, hey! Are you trying to fact check me? What, you don't- you clicked on this video and you don't trust me? Mani Ichi Iso is one of those all-in-one type apps. There are mini games, social options, and it served as a news app covering everything PlayStation as well as global news. Toro Inoue is the mascot of the franchise, but isn't known too well outside of Japan, but that's not to say that he's a complete stranger to audiences elsewhere. Toto makes his appearance in games like Street Fighter Cross Tekken, White Knight Chronicles 2, Little Big Planet, and many more. Though most likely you know Toto because of his appearance in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. I personally find it weird that this didn't become the mascot of everything PlayStation, considering how much they added him to other titles. There are many beloved icons to make their mark on the PS3, but Toro was limited to Japan and it's kind of a shame. And for the main event, the five exclusives that were supposed to move PS3s. It's important to note that at E3 before launch, Sony was pushing the PS3 as an all-around entertainment hub you know, in a time where that was actually a selling point? A great move is this made for a much more convincing argument for any kid trying to convince their parents to buy the system. It played Blu-ray, DVD, music CD, PlayStation 1, and 2 discs. Even if you didn't get a launch title, you at least had a better way to play your old PlayStation games. The only things working against this beefy monolith were the proposed controller, the price tag, and the exclusives. Two of the five games received a positive review while the others sat at a 5 out of 10 or below. Now, in all fairness, there were a lot of hurdles for early PS3 games. The high expectations for graphics thanks to the phony Killzone 2 trailer really didn't help things. The PS3 was more than capable to live up to those expectations though, but the cell processor technology being new to most teams in conjunction with receiving late dev kits made the balancing act of making high-end graphics with well-tuned and engaging gameplay a Herculean task. Ridge Racer 7 is a fairly competent entry into the franchise. Despite being a longtime Sony IP, the franchise did switch up to the Xbox 360 for Ridge Racer 6 the year before, which didn't seem to cause too much bad blood as Ridge Racer would come out with a few more games for the PS3 in the later years. But back to 7. The cars look great. The tracks are interesting and the races are easy to learn but hard to master. Drift, draft, boost are the only verbs on display here. Drifting is a battle and it's not welcoming to new players, but when you nail a drift 
just right, every ounce of frustration melts away. It's a constantly challenging yet rewarding racing experience. However, I personally only find it to be good in short bursts as it doesn't really have that just one more race factor that something like Gran Turismo has. The campaign mode is solid, but it's clear that the emphasis was on the online aspects, something that I don't really have experience with today because the servers are down. Player stats were constantly tracked and in real time so that you could see where you stood in the grand scheme of things. While I know I'd be on the bottom of most of these lists, it seems like a very entertaining feature to have. Like I said before, the series would see a few more entries before going completely dormant. I'm just shocked that Ridge Racer died on the PS3. It's always been a staple of Sony's library, and the fact that Namco hasn't resurrected it in any form is kind of a mystery, but it's a great opening exclusive for the console. Untold Legends Dark Kingdom is the continuation of a franchise that saw its success on the PSP. On hearing that fact alone, I was intrigued. I looked up the gameplay of the first two titles and saw that it was a fantasy beat-em-up, and I assumed that the PS3 version would be a significant upgrade that would push the series forward. I was wrong. This should have stayed as a Sony handheld exclusive. There's some leeway with expectation for handhelds. At the time, not many people expected the portable version of a AAA game to be exactly like its console counterpart. But when given the opportunity to flesh out the story, mechanics, and world of the franchise, Untold Legend fumbled the ball. There is an accepted amount of repetition with handheld titles. The cartridge can only hold so much data, so there's an expectation for minimalism. But that same grace isn't given to console games. Well, not unless the core loop is damn near flawless. So when the only things that change from the PSP to PS3 is a different camera angle, new characters, and a story completely detached from the original two titles, it's no surprise that this game flopped. There was use of the online co-op format, which is great for beat-em-up games, but that's not really going to sustain intrigue, especially as a launch title for a system that had a low adoption rate. And it's important not to forget that one of the big selling points at this time was graphical fidelity, and compared to the other beat-em-ups with roots in the previous Sony systems, Dark Kingdom doesn't even come close to Genji Days of Blade. To be frank, it doesn't even stack up against PS2 era beat-em-ups. These cutscenes feel like they're out of an old school World of Warcraft machinima, with none of the wit or charisma that made those videos fun to watch. There's no subtlety in the story, and it doesn't even stand out from other games in the fantasy genre. The opening level bashes you over the head with hints that the king you're working for is corrupt, only to visit him and find out he's redecorated the place. Now demons have taken over and you have to fight every last one of them in the same manner. I just want to be fair to the developers. Yes, it was a strenuous dev cycle. Yes, the technology was difficult and there were probably very tight deadlines. But if this was the game that I got on launch, the only game that I got on launch, I might just have taken it back, asked for a refund and bought a 360 with that money. Mobile Suit Gundam Crossfire. This game was crucified at launch. Allegations of everything from having last-gen graphics to slow and cliche gameplay to tedious menu design set this game lower than any of the other launch titles. Mobile Suit Gundam Crossfire got a one out of uh, five because it's the worst piece of crap I've seen all year. And you know what, Adam Sessler circa 2006? I think you're wrong. Ish. Now, I will say that I'm not familiar with this genre, and I've never watched an episode of Gundam in my life, but I think that this game was extremely fun. The damage system makes for some of the most wild combat encounters. Now, the lock-on system makes it difficult to aim at anything other than center mass, but in close quarters combat, I found that you can get everything except one limb ripped off and still win the battle. <laughs> Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I've heard worse. You liar. Come on, you pansy. To all units, it looks like the enemy has had enough. The mission was a success. We are victorious. Sure, most fights boil down to circle, strafe, and shoot, but your limited ammo supply drains fast. So you have to decide, do you want to push and use melee or retreat and resupply? And resupplying 
doesn't stop the pace of battle. You can get tracked down and take damage while getting loaded up. Your supply ships can also be taken out by the enemy, so you have to take the objective while also defending your resupply, because once it's gone, you better be good at melee. There's also the very real chance that you could lose your gun in combat, again forcing you to make a hard decision. Do I group up with my team in order to slowly take out the enemies, or do I go straight for the objective hoping that no one notices me destroying the bridge with my one good arm? Though, I will say that the team AI isn't very focused or smart, so unless you've fully outfitted them with the best Gundams and pilots, they won't be much help or what little help they were providing in the first place. There's a shocking amount of emergent gameplay at hand, though it takes a lot of patience to get there, which means that the emergent gameplay might be less so a function of the game and more so a function of my aforementioned patience. A lot of critics cite the clunky movement as a source of frustration. Oh uh, yeah. You're a giant metal robot, things are gonna be a little clunky. It takes a bit to get used to, but that awkward movement intensifies the feeling of being in a mech. That's not a strong argument, especially because the choppy movement mixed with the numerous graphical glitches doesn't make for good stew. Nevertheless, I liked the simulated robo clunk. Something else I really liked is the management aspect. You have to be calculated with your downtime and money across a few different areas. Buying better Gundams, hiring pilots, repairs, upgrades, pilot rest, and picking the battles to participate in all require in-game time. Depending on how much damage you and your team took in the last battle, it might take up to three days to repair. Buying some of the larger Gundams takes up to two days to ship, while it takes a full day to hire a new pilot or get an upgrade. This contrasts with the battles currently going on. There's a specific window of time that you have to partake in any given skirmish. While not incredibly deep, this management aspect was fun, and I enjoyed it. But the lack of any real consequence for improper time and resource management may be the reason that the system was overlooked by the critics. I will say that levels never feel all that fresh, objectives don't change much from mission to mission, and the lack of any real narrative through line does pose an issue for the overall experience. The graphical and technical abilities of this game don't really help either. Consistent frame rate issues and graphics that genuinely looked like they were meant for the PS2 era, yeah, it deserves flack there, culminating in the feeling that Crossfire had been rushed out the door. But do I think it deserves the 33 out of 100 or the 1 out of 5 or even the title of shovelware of the highest order. No, it's leagues better than Untold Legends. Despite being rough around the edges, I still think that there's a solid foundation of a game here. Genji Days of Blade, another game that continues on a franchise from a previous Sony system only to die here on the PS3. The story starts where Dawn of the Samurai stopped, which is great for folks who played it, but for everyone else there's a cutscene to fill us in. The plot is fun and captivating, but the stilted English voice acting really gets in the way. You must be a Tamayori priestess. Yes, you're Shizuka, aren't you? Who oh, seek my pardon? Thanks to you, the world is now rid of Kiyomori. <laughs> Very impressive. You fed. Yo, yikes. Out of all the launch titles, and dare I say, out of all the PS3 games, this is a one of the best looking. The sets are packed with detail and the character models are incredibly vibrant, but that doesn't really mean much when the camera's too busy getting stuck on everything but you. There's a lot to like about Genji Days of Blade, but the unintended difficulty added to combat because of the fixed camera system makes for an experience that's hard to recommend. Now, had I played this during the time that it came out, I most likely would have pushed on regardless. It doesn't ruin the whole experience. The combat's fun, enough despite the inevitability of it growing stale. This feels like a strange pick for a launch offering, but when you consider that the PS2 era was Sony's most experimental era in terms of introducing Western audiences to different types and styles of games, it does make some sense that they would try and carry that over into the next generation. Okay, to round this out, we have the one that folks most remember. Resistance Fall of Man, a conceptually simple game, World War II with aliens, unfolds into one of the most fun shooters that that generation would see. The gunplay of this series is unmatched, doing what most FPSs couldn't dream of, making me consistently switch guns for strategic purpose. I found myself constantly thinking of my next move. Will I need raw firepower, shields, or a way to take 
take enemies out of cover. The secondary fire options are really what makes this game stand head and shoulders above the rest, allowing you to devise your own strategy. Now in a more in-depth review, I might talk about how the story grows a bit cliche towards the end, how I'm not in love with the dry color palette, and how some of the chapters are just absolutely uninspired. But none of that really matters when the gameplay is as tight as this. There's a reason that Resistance saw a very profitable franchise, and that's because it's rare to find a launch title that holds this level of staying power. Listen, to be a must play title for the console so far after launch, so far after the death of the franchise, and so far after the death of the console, should in theory be the only proof needed to show that the first year of PS3 titles was exceptional. I think Morgan Webb really nailed it when she said, Launch games rarely capture the full potential of a console, but in this case, one glorious game did give us a glimpse of the real possibility presented by the PS3. After launch week, there was still around a month left in Q4. This brought us Mahjong, Taikai 4, Fight Night Round 3, Ghost of Dooku, Lemmings HD, Full Auto 2 Battle Lines, Blazing Angels Squadron of World War II, Railfan Chicago Transit Authority Brown Line, and Gran Turismo HD Concept, just in time to close out 2006. Full Auto 2 Battle Lines pulled the reverse of Ridge Racer 6, taking an exclusive from Microsoft and putting it exclusively on a Sony console, though this sequel wouldn't see quite as high of a critical reception as the 360 title. Not really all that important in the grand scheme of the PS3, but a neat note for sure. Gran Turismo HD Concept was a downloadable vertical slice demo for a possible remake of the first GT game on PlayStation 1. It's no longer on PSN, and you can only play it through a limited run Japanese install disc, the full version of Gran Turismo HD never saw the light of day, and the project shifted focus to GT5 Prologue. Rounding this quarter off with my personal holy grail, Railfan Chicago Transit Authority Brown Line. Everything you need to know about this game is in the title. It's a train sim that lets you take control of the Chicago elevated train line. I think the magic of this is that it's a Japanese exclusive where you play exclusively in Chicago. It oozes irony in that regard. Railfan Chicago Transit Authority Brown Line is kind of rare, and with that comes a price tag to match. But some day, I'll have the money, and I'll be able to drive that train right above that old mom and pop breakfast shop, take an illegal pause just to hear some man sing about eating pancakes under the elevated train. This joke was just for my grandfather. Please do not laugh unless you were my grandfather. Thanks. Quarter one in any year is typically slow for video games. Despite that trend, this quarter was an absolute whirlwind for the PS3. We got Grip Shift, Sonic 06 finally coming to the PS3, thank God, Virtual Fighter 5, Qbert HD, Flow, MLB 2K7, F1 Championship Edition, Tekken 5 Dark Resurrection, NBA Street Home Court, Def Jam Icon, Motor Storm, College Hoops 2K7, The Godfather The Dawn's Edition, Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion, Virtual Tennis 3, Armored Core 4, Mist of Chaos only in Japan, and Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Double Agent. There's not much you can shrug off here. The reboot of Sonic the Hedgehog had a hard enough time on the Xbox 360. I could not imagine the horror of being the person in charge of the PS3 version. In exchange for getting Sonic 06 late, PS3 owners got Virtual Fighter 5 eight months early. That's a good deal. Flow would be the start of the artsy indie games on PSN, a trend that brought us Flower and Journey. Sony has always had a nice background push for what I would call high art games. PlayStation has always been the home for daring titles that stretch the definition of what it means to be a game and how we can use the medium to enhance art as a whole. Look no further than the Ico games, Detuned and Linger in Shadows to prove this. Unfortunately, the idea of high concept video game art pieces is something that I think died on the PS3. But for now, in our context, Flow is the start of something really cool. 
While a lot of these games deserve a spotlight, most of the big names aren't even exclusive to the PS3. But MotorStorm is where things get kicked into an extra gear. This is the most stunning game to have come out on the console at this point in the timeline, even rivaling Genji Days of Blade and Resistance Fall of Man, truly taking advantage of everything that the Cell processor could offer. Playing this game 16 years post-launch, I find that it stands with the rest of the titans that the PS3 produced. High praise for something that I don't enjoy. Yeah, I don't like dirt racing. Street and track racing is really all that I can fathom, and I'm still struggling with how NASCAR works. But I will barely hit him. But MotorStorm quells that insecurity through its rampant chaos. You don't have to be a good racer to win, you just have to be good enough to survive. The moldable terrain is wildly impressive. Changing aspects of the course in real time has absolutely blown me away. These ruts and grooves in the mud make for a constant hurdle rather than one big set piece explosion, making for a race experience so unique that it did move consoles. And that's just one aspect of a typical MotorStorm race. You can select any vehicle on any course. Now, there are some limitations for some races, but for the most part, any vehicle can win any race. There are branching pathways that aid for specific types. Massive trucks can make an easy time of the mud, while bikes can take these tiny jump paths to steer clear of the larger vehicles. There's also a combative element, which allows for even more chaos. All of this culminates in races that require strategy. Out of all the games in this episode that I think are worth buying for the PS3 in 2022, this is the most accessible. As I mentioned previously, quarter one is typically the slow part of the year for games, but for 2007 and the PS3 specifically, Q2 fills that role. Seeing an increased amount of third-party titles, in particular movie tie-ins, but less on the exclusive side. Enchanted Arms, Mortal Kombat 2, Fear, Professional Yaku Spirits 4, only in Japan, Super Rub-A-Dub, Gauntlet 2, Spider-Man 3, Rampart, Calling All Cars, MLB The Show 07, Rampage World Tour, Pirate Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, Joust, Surf's Up, Championship Sprint, Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, The Bigs, The Darkness, The Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, Transformers, and Super Stardust HD. While not seeing much worthy of note, there are a few interesting trends here. One might see the growing amount of movie tie-in games and assume that third-party developers were starting to get a hang of making things for the PS3. But when we look at the scores for these games, none of them did better than a 67 out of 100. And when we look at them side by side, their 360 versions on average tend to fare a little bit better. Now, I'll admit that tie-in games for movies don't tend to have the best reputation, and that very well could have been a contributing factor to the poor reception, but we need to also consider that development time for these type of games tends to run detrimentally short, and doing so while learning a new difficult hardware only compounds the possibility of a poor end product. On a tangential note, for those unaware, Sony used the old Sam Raimi Spider-Man font for the first version of the PS3 logo. Later on they would change this, but it makes looking at the Spider-Man 3 movie tie-in game box a bit odd. I don't know, just kind of a fun thing I noticed here in the edit. In this quarter, we were treated to a number of solid PlayStation Network titles, a decent few HD remasters of old arcade cabinets, and standout new exclusive titles like Calling All Cars and Super Stardust HD. The former being a four-way capture the flag type game with cars, and the latter being a twin stick shooter with a fresh take on asteroids. These were the first titles to really catch the eye of the consumer and made PSN stand toe to toe with the Xbox Live Arcade. On a side note, Super Stardust HD was the first game to ever have trophies. Just a fun little tidbit for you. Things start to heat up the closer we get to Q4 of 07, seeing games like Ninja Gaiden Sigma, Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3, Wagon Knights All Pro Football 2K8, NCAA Football 08, NASCAR 08, Nucleus, Pyotama, Madden 08, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter 2, Tiger Woods PGA Tour 08, Dynasty Warriors Gundam, Warhawk, Super Puzzle Fighters 2 Turbo HD Remix, Lair, NHL 2K8, NHL 08, Dirt, 
Heavenly Sword, Pixel Junk Racers, High Stakes on the Vegas Strip Super Turbo HD Remix, Megazone 23, Stuntman Ignition, Loco Roco, Coco Rico, Skate, and World Series of Poker 08 Battle for the Bracelet Super Turbo HD Remix. Ninja Gaiden Sigma is the first appearance of the series on this platform. The previous generation saw Ninja Gaiden Black be an Xbox exclusive. Sigma is a more or less enhanced HD version of Black with some added features. Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3 is the continuation of a series that only the Japanese audience got. There is an effort to translate the original game from the PS1, but it's done by fans, so things are going to be a little slow, which does mean that getting a translation for the third game is going to take even longer. However, the first seven days of Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3 are translated thanks to the YouTube channel Rai B. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What is Boku no Natsu Yasumi and why should you care? Well, it's a series where you play as a young child navigating a summer vacation adventure in the Japanese countryside. While staying with your aunt and uncle, you get to help with farm work, collect bugs, fish, and escapade around with your older cousin and her friends. Sometimes a piece of media does such a good job at being able to convey an emotion that it's hard to find words to describe it accurately. But Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3 is a summer vacation in disc form. Freedom is the focal point of this title. While the core gameplay loop is sort of a point and click adventure where you have to complete certain tasks, you're free to do whatever you want from sun up to sun down. And when the sun sets, you can talk to your family, listen to the radio, or catalog the new bugs you just caught. There is a lot to love about this title, but cataloging your bugs at the end of the day with the radio playing in the background is so satisfying and wholesome. Well, as wholesome as killing bugs can be. Honestly, bug collecting could be the entire game and I would have been over the moon. Like I said before, there are only seven of the 30 total days translated, so there's more to this game that I haven't played. And from the looks of it, Ryby doesn't seem to have time to finish the fan translation. The developer's Millennial Kitchen did get a game on the 3DS translated. Attack of the Friday Monsters, A Tokyo Tale, did incredibly well in the Western markets, garnered great critical praise, and ends up on a lot of lists of games games to get before the eShop goes down. So maybe there is hope that these games will get translated. I love Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3 and I'm glad that I got the chance to take a look at it. Now would I recommend this game? Yes and no. I would recommend this game to everyone, but only when it becomes translated and it's easier and more accessible. But for all of those people who speak Japanese and are cozy gamers, Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3 is a must have unique title. Warhawk was truly ahead of its time. An online only big battle multiplayer shooter. I'm sure it was cool, but the servers went down a long time ago and there isn't any offline play. Not to mention PS3 emulation isn't easy to get going, but if you're interested, there is a fan effort through software called PS1 where games are still being carried on. All that I can say is that the critics liked it, so that's gotta count for something, right? Lair was a game that was hyped to the moon by previous E3s. Being a product of Factor 5, folks had high expectations. Initially slated as another launch title, the original pitch for this game was that you were a wyvern riding mercenary for hire. At the start of any battle, you can choose a side, each side offering something different, giving the player choice between something like honor, trinkets, gold, or something to that effect. Whatever you choose, you'd bring back to your lair and it'd be there for you to admire. An amazing concept that is unfortunately no way reflective of the final version. Even more disappointing is that Factor 5 had another game in development at the same time. This was supposed to be a World War I game with cute animal characters to contrast the heinous violence. This era of gaming wasn't quite ready for this level of dissonance, but looking at it from a modern perspective, Animal Wars was just ahead of its time. Unfortunately, both the original pitch as well as Animal Wars were scrapped as deadlines and poor management pushed Lair closer to release. Lair was originally slated to be a PS3 launch title, however they missed that 2006 release date. Even more misfortune befell Lair when it shipped with no option to turn off the 6-axis motion control and instead opting to send reviewers booklets on how to play the game. The reviewers did not receive this well. There was a day one patch that did fix this, but the damage was done. 
And that's the history that I knew before going into this game. But is it a representative snapshot of Lair? I'd say no. I set out to play this game exclusively with the six axis controls to see if it was really as bad as the critics said. Well, it's not the best game in the world. And I'll admit that if you weren't invested in this game as much as I was, then maybe the motion controls could get annoying. But it's not a very long title and motion controls make it kind of a unique experience. The development team wasn't excited about the Sony mandated use of the DualShock's motion controls. The devs did add checks and balances to even out the difficulty so that the challenge comes from the objective at hand and not things that are out of your control. Personally, I think that this minimizes frustrations, but take that with a grain of salt. As I mentioned before, I have a high tolerance for bad games, and in doing so, I'm at times almost detrimentally patient with games that I'm intrigued by. The tide of battle system makes you feel like you have a very tangible impact on these large scale conflicts going on underneath you. Honestly, if you liked the gameplay of any other Factor 5's work, then you'll probably enjoy Lair. Where it starts to falter is in the story department. The characters are unfortunately forgettable and the conflict doesn't really add any stakes to the gameplay side. It's clear that this story took a backseat to gameplay. To reiterate, I sympathize with the development team here. Story sometimes has to take a backseat so that the game can work. And the team having to rebuild the game from the ground up because they didn't have dev kits until late into development is an unfortunate reason for why I think that the story didn't receive the attention it deserved. I don't remember most of the cutscenes, but I do remember the fights. In my opinion, if something has to be scaled back in favor of something else working as intended, then I'll sacrifice a good story for a fun game anytime. Now, as far as graphics go, Factor 5 pushed themselves to the limit using all the tools that the PS3 could give them. The amount of objects in the map is astounding, but don't get too far away or the seams will start to show. The level of detail really shifts hard from photorealistic to shape stacked on top of each other. Lair doesn't compete graphically with the other PS3 titles, which is unlucky for Factor 5 as it's one of the most important elements a game could have at this time. Lair would be the last game that Factor 5 would put out before closing their doors. If you are a die-hard PS3 fan and you've put off playing this game for a while, I think you should reconsider. Lair won't astound, but it is a unique and enjoyable experience. Heavenly Sword, much like Lair, had extreme hype behind it thanks to conventions like E3. The developers Ninja Theory have an almost spotless record these days, but Heavenly Sword was only their second game after Kung Fu Chaos. Untested for the most part, this team set out to show the world how powerful the graphical capabilities of the PS3 were. This is right up there with Genji and Motorstorm for one of the best looking games on the console so far, edging out the competition with extremely cinematic cuts scenes. However, graphics are nothing without a good art style, and that's something found here in Bushels. The bosses really stand out in the art department though. All of them have some kind of animal theme, and it's great. There's Snake Lady, Harvey Birdman, Roly Polioli, and uh, um, uh, this guy just has a cool crow for a pet. And hey, would you look at that? Andy Serkis is in this game. Heavenly Sword often gets compared to God of War, which a lot of reviewers seem to mention with contemptuous tone. But both titles are Sony IPs, and at this point aren't really in competition in the same way that something like Resistance and Halo were. So I think that this is a bit of a moot point. Additionally, Heavenly Sword adds a few new elements like stances, parries, shooting sections, and even will have you play as completely different characters, which does break up the monotony any beat em ups so frequently run into. However, the aforementioned stances and parries aren't emphasized in early gameplay, but full mastery of these two mechanics are required for the final boss fight, which you think would make sense because the final boss of any game is meant to test your skills. However, this culminates in one of the worst boss fights I've ever played. It genuinely took me two days to beat him. You are punished for playing any other way than the one intended. 95% of the game, I didn't find myself needing to switch stances or parry much. But in addition to that, you need expert timing and a good heaping spoonful of luck. On top of this intense test of skill, there's also bad programming that takes the fight from a challenge to a downright frustration. I genuinely would like to recommend this game to anyone, but when you get to the final boss fight and you try it a few times and you decide to give up, just look up the end 
and then you can say that you beat it. Nothing has ever made me test the tensile strength of my DualShock controller more than this final boss fight with Bohan. Overlooking that, Heavenly Sword rivals Resistance for one of the most fleshed out fun AAA outings for the PS3 thus far. There was a planned movie, but that got canceled. And then that was supposed to turn into a sci-fi TV exclusive, but then that also went under in 2008 when the housing crisis hit. The film was finally cobbled together and saw a limited run DVD release. It is significantly uglier than the in-game cutscenes, and it's a worse retelling of the same story you've seen in the game, with a bunch of things retconned for no reason. Nariko should have gotten a franchise. She deserves more than just a spot in the PS All-Stars roster. Hell, her stage isn't even in the base game. You have to buy it for two bucks extra. There were rumors floating around that Ninja Theory's smash hit Hellblade Satsuna's Sacrifice was supposed to be a spiritual successor to Heavenly Sword, but that was quickly put to bed. While the final boss battle really tainted this whole experience for me, I do wish that Heavenly Sword got a second chance. Narratively, it's one of the stronger games on this list, with one of the most engaging worlds I've experienced in a long time. Okay everyone, brace yourselves. Quarter four up to the first year anniversary is an explosion of games. We've got NBA Live 08, NBA 2K8, Go Sports Ski, FIFA 08, Sega Rally Revo, Folklore, Everyday Shooter, NBA 08, yes, that is three different basketball games in the same week. Tony Hawk's Proving Ground, Juice 2, Hot Import Nights, Conan, Ratatouille, Clive Barker's Jericho, Ratchet and Clank, Future Tools of Destruction, Eye of Judgment, Operation Creature Feature, Guitar Hero 3, Legends of Rock, Stranglehold, The Simpsons Game, Cars, Mater Nation Championship, Call of Duty 4, Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga, Blazing Angels 2, Secret Missions of World War II, Blades of the Hundred Year War, Sega Golf Club, Beowulf The Game, Need for Speed Pro Street, Kanan Lynch Deadman, WWE Smackdown vs. Raw 08, and Assassin's Creed. Uncharted 1 would be released November 19th, 2007, just after the PS3's anniversary. So it doesn't make this list, just in case you are wondering. This is the point where major third-party games really enter the fray. And not just any third-party games, but quintessential bops. Call of Duty 4, Guitar Hero 3, Lego Star Wars, Assassin's Creed. Things are starting to pick up speed for this generation. However, none None of these games would really pull prospective console buyers as you could play these on 360 which at this point was still cheaper. Even with having free online play, Xbox still had the larger user base where your friends were probably playing Call of Duty. So these games don't really help the PS3 compete, they are more or less good additions to the library of people who already had the systems though. Folklore is in serious contention for the most unique game on the entire system. It's like Irish Pokemon, but instead of using Pokemon to fight each other, you take them by the tail and smack them against each other like a sack of potatoes. A weird way to describe anything, but hopefully you'll agree that it's accurate. Folklore takes its inspiration from Irish folklore, it's obviously in the title. You have a choice between two protagonists, Ellen and Keats named after John Keats, notable um, en English poet, and uh, Ellen, who's not seeming to be named after anyone. Listen, there's not a whole lot I would change about folklore, but the naming convention of the main characters is definitely on the chopping block. If you were going for literary references, why not switch Ellen's name to Emily to be like John Keats and Emily Dickinson? And also, you could go a step further and instead of naming him Keats, name him Wilde after actual Irish poet Oscar Wilde. There's even a character later on in the second chapter named Wilde. There was a real opportunity here and it was just kind of squandered for no reason. <laughs> Amelia agrees. That aside, the two meet in a small seaside town to uncover the mysteries plaguing both Ellen and the town itself. What follows is a fantastical romp through Celtic lore, fighting monsters modeled after these old stories. But where does the whole defeating the monsters by hitting them with other monsters fit in? Each attack is given to you by defeating a monster in a sort of beat em up style. Once you've defeated the monster, they grant you their powers, then every subsequent enemy that you attack and defeat adds to the stats of that move. It's like if you were to beat up a Rattata and 
and learned bite from it. And every other Rattata you beat powered up your bite. There is another step where you have to suck out the monster's soul in order to defeat it properly, but um, that doesn't fit in with the whole Pokemon comparison, so uh, yeah. The further you progress in the game, the more powers you get. Certain powers have specific abilities like fire, ice, earth, thunder, and the sort. Certain enemies will have weaknesses to some attacks, and some attacks are also needed to solve puzzles. It's a genius system that is a treat to play. Folklore didn't sell well, and copies for it go for a pretty decent chunk of change these days. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Should you buy a PS3 just to play Folklore? Yes. But if that upfront cost is too much, I'd say it's worth keeping an eye on the PS3 emulation scene. It's a unique game that deserves to be on your must playlist. I would be remiss not to discuss the first Ratchet & Clank game to grace the new console, that being Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction. Insomniac having one of the most pristine track records out of all Sony developers made the excitement and expectation for this game skyrocket. Not to mention coming out with a hit launch title. Fans were expecting a lot. What they got was a surprising tone shift in presentation, but with all the high quality gameplay that the series is known for still intact. It's almost like the higher end graphics and focus on more cinematic cutscenes took away from the game's famously dry wit. For reference, think about the differences between the first game and then the 2016 movie tie-in remake. It's too polished and clean and doesn't fit in with the cheeky tone that this mini robo lombax combo is known for. Again, it's not a bad game at all, it's just a small departure from expectation. Something that the series would get into a pattern of fixing and falling back into throughout the PS3 era. Eye of Judgment is a weird game to pull attention to because I've never played it. Regardless, the tech, ambition, and execution of this was impressive and therefore deserves a mention at the very least. It's the kind of card game for folks who watched Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid and loved the idea of their cards getting a 3D visualization during the battle. Eye of Judgment was a fully formed collectible card game that you could play without the PS3. But when you add the video game component, not only are you getting your stats tracked automatically, but you're also getting those sweet, sweet anime fulfilling battle animations. I'm shocked that no other collectible card game company approached Japan Studios to develop their TCG into a game of a similar fashion. This could have sold like hot cakes on a Sunday morning, but instead copies go by the way of forgotten gimmick games despite being very well made. By the end of the first full year, the PlayStation 3 had sold around 11 million units, in comparison to the 19 million Xbox sold. Those numbers are accounting for Microsoft's head start, and considering that Sony was selling their console at a loss larger than industry standard, it was clear that the Xbox 360 had won the launch race in terms of gathering a larger user base. Which console had the better launch in terms of games is a topic for another video, and it'd be another year before Microsoft's rush to market would hit them with the red ring of death. All that in consideration, it's pretty easy to say that Sony had a very rocky launch, but looking at the trends that the PS3's games set in motion, we can see that this console was headed in the right direction. We can see a bigger focus with online multiplayer, not just in the typical sports spaces, but with online multiplayer co-op in Untold Legends, or you can also look Look at the stat tracking in Ridge Racer 7. Xbox may have popularized the use of internet and games, but with titles like Resistance Fall of Man running more smooth than most online games today, Sony was able to prove how effective their console was with online architecture. Sony may not have had the biggest install base, but they did have free online multiplayer features, making access to these titles available to all players at the start prolonging the lives of most multiplayer games to this day. We also see the start of digital exclusive content coming into prominence. Flow, Calling All Cars, and Stardust HD almost immediately legitimize this new game format with their unique approaches to gameplay and storytelling, laying the foundation for massive hits like Fat Princess, Tokyo Jungle, Sound Shapes, and the like. 
Region locking systems was also done away during this generation, allowing for anyone to import games like Boku no Natsu Yasumi 3, Wagon Knights, and games from the PAL region as well. While not a trend that everyone would utilize, it's an awesome step forward for hardcore fans. The final and largest trend was the diverse exclusive game lineup, made by teams that would work hard to decipher the cell processing power and attempt to use it in its fullest. Even games like Lair that weren't widely seen as successful were able to pull off large-scale battles that were unique for the time and dare I say it's still pretty unique now. Likewise, we see studios that use it as a launch point. Heavenly Sword didn't get a sequel, but it sold well, saw critical success, and Ninja Theory would go on to make even more great games, eventually ironically becoming viable enough to be bought by Microsoft. Similarly, Insomniac would venture out of their typical genre comfort zone to create one of the quintessential shooters of the era. The place PlayStation 3 offered something that no other console has offered before. It was an all-in-one living room package. It was a PlayStation 1 and 2 combined, and it offered free online play. Now add that all on top of one of the most unique lineup of first-year titles, and you have the start of an amazing system. We can sit here and talk about how the PS3 was hard to develop for, how it was late to market, how it was expensive and cost Sony a lot of money, but that cannot overshadow the much more more interesting fact that the PlayStation 3's launch was filled with brilliant games that were crafted with little knowledge of the system, tight deadlines, but still persevered, forged by passionate teams wanting to test the limits of the medium and change player expectations. They say a console doesn't hold up without its games, but the PlayStation 3 is one of the few systems where there's a true symbiosis between hardware and software. Thanks for watching. If you're a fan of the PlayStation 3, make sure to hit like and subscribe. Obviously, I'm a huge fan and I intend to make more videos about it in the future. Huge thanks to Evan from Luxstat as always for help with uh, any and all of the graphic design work you've seen. Without him, I uh, my stuff would look like garbage. Check out his channel in the description. Again, thanks for watching.